Hello and welcome to my review of the novelization of Star Trek The Motion Picture by Gene Roddenberry, famed creator of the original series. The book was released in 1979 as part of the merchandising for the movie. Curiously, it is the only completed novel by Roddenberry, whose career as a television producer is extensive, but it is based on a story by Alan Dean Foster, whose career as an author is something close to legendary. Foster is much better known for being the go-to writer for film novelizations, so Star Trek may be, though his bibliography is too extensive to be sure, the first time a novelization was written based on Foster's work rather than the other way round. It begins a few years after the end of Kirk and Company's famous five-year mission. While many of the crew remain with the Enterprise as it's being extensively rebuilt, Spock and Kirk have gone their own way. Spock is on Vulcan seeking new ways to exercise his human half, while Kirk is reduced to a role that is little more than a sinecure. He is the famous ambassador and figurehead for Starfleet, but dislikes not having anything to challenge him. Somewhat bizarrely, the book begins with a foreword from James T. Kirk, proposing that what follows is true and accurate, while also criticising those that have exaggerated his previous adventures. From here it moves on to an author's note, questioning how he got the gig after being one of them same exaggerators, but stating a love for all things Star Trek. There are also a number of footnotes through the text, some reportedly from Kirk, that emphasise or explain certain aspects of the story. I've not seen them in any other Trek book before, and certainly not in a novelisation, so they're an interesting, if somewhat unnecessary, addition, likely an attempt to lend a degree of seriousness to proceedings, as Kirk's introduction does. The story begins with Kirk getting an image on a chip implanted in his brain of a vast space phenomena attacking three Klingon cruisers. This is all being relayed by long-distance probes from a base called Epsilon 9. The probe, seemingly indestructible and enormous, will be at Earth in three days. Kirk receives this message and hatches a plan. He can use the crisis to take back command of the Enterprise. A lot is made of him convincing himself that he does so purely because he's the best man for this job, while others, including Bones, wonder if he actually is. The new ship, unlaunched and not complete, is the only vessel close enough to intercept, which seems ridiculous if it was previously in Klingon space and is heading for Earth. There must be some sort of fleet involved in Starfleet, and surely at least part of that is in the vicinity of such a famous hotspot. But the plot needs all of this to happen, or it and the book would only be as long as your standard TV episode. Kirk has it out with the head of Starfleet, resenting inwardly how he has been used by Starfleet in his new role, but he also uses that to his advantage because, after all, if he is the famous figurehead they've made him out to be, then surely he's the best man for this job. It would be nice to see this manipulative side of Kirk played out a little bit more. After all, he is a Starfleet captain and the protagonist of the story, so he needs something to overcome. Instead, Roddenberry moves through that phase of the story quite rapidly, making more of his past relationship with a subordinate and his travelled headquarters than his time when he actually gets there. However, he is back on the Enterprise in what feels like pretty quick time, and to be fair to all concerned, that is where Star Trek fans want to see Captain Kirk. This is also the side of the novel where Roddenberry does his best work in relating the characters, but also in relating their love of space and especially their ship. Bones observes, The love of man for a vessel and the love for a woman will rarely bear more than poetic comparison, but Roddenberry plays up the feminine side of the Enterprise, not least with this passage. She hung there outside the lacy filigree of the orbital dry dock, Enterprise. Although when Kirk's arrival on the ship is described in this way, Kirk felt the pod mating home. I'm unsure if I'd like it to be an extension of that sexualization or not. His arrival puts the new Captain Decker's nose out of joint by taking his command, but here I was grateful for Roddenberry's brevity because Decker remains a member of Starfleet, and in the Trek future, these people are supposed to be professionals, if not going so far as to say they're all aspirational figures. Decker is entitled to a little sulk, but he still does his job, and well enough that Kirk spends much of his time wondering if he'd done the right thing by taking over his command. The job, though, is getting the new ship ready for its launch, which they do in double quick time in order to meet the probe. Complicating things is Ilea, the new Delton navigator, who has a romantic history with Decker. As a Delton, she also exudes pheromones that make all the male crew hope that they're in line for something similar. 
so much so that in an unnecessary moment neither Sulu or Kirk want to get out of their seat for fear of revealing just how much they're hoping for something similar. Sulu felt it hardly prudent to stand up at this moment, but unlike Kirk, he had no choice and therefore tried to seem to be bowing to her as he rose. While it's nice to see the crew unite, and there's an obvious joy from the creators in both that and the remodeled Enterprise, this entire section is filler. It's well-paced and enjoyable filler, but filler it is. The transporter malfunctions and kills the science officer along with the girl who Kirk had a prior relationship with, though her reason for being there is a mystery to Kirk and the reader. In the next scene, the transporter is fixed and working, with no more effort than transporter room and chief engineer Scott report transporter bought a system fully repaired and now functioning normally, sir. Roddenberry's novelization certainly has a better pace than the movie does. Nothing here really drags or has you looking for your watch. The only issue with it is that you could begin the story on page 109 by giving Kirk a captain's log that explains the probe and their mission is to intercept it. The only thing you'd lose by that would be Spelk's journey from emotionless to his old self, but when he's absent for the vast amount of the first 90 pages, it is a bit of a toss-up. After all, Nimoy was only convinced to return to the role when a family member told him it would not be Star Trek without Spock. Spock is absent because he's on Vulcan, trying to finish a Vulcan path to utter stoicism, but he has a psychic contact with the oncoming probe and leaves his training unfinished. How fortunate that the death of his replacement opens up such a timely vacancy for him. On the Enterprise, the warp engines malfunction, creating a wormhole that they narrowly avoid. Spock then arrives and fixes the engines. Because of his training, he's aloof and cold with the rest of the crew, but he joins the ship for his mission anyway. The Enterprise reaches the probe and is attacked by it, though survives better than the Klingons did. The ship is sucked inside the probe, which appears to be a city-sized spaceship. A smaller probe appears on the bridge and searches the mechanical systems, injuring a few of the crew in the process. A security guard attacks it with a phaser and then he's disappeared and the probe then leaves as well, taking Ilea with it. However, her physical form soon returns. Talking robotically, she calls herself Vija and explains that she is there to study the crew who she calls an infestation. Kirk orders her to learn from Decker and orders Decker to do whatever it takes to learn from her. Spock travels out into the wider ship and learns that it is, in fact, a gigantic life form. He attempts a mind meld but cannot cope with the power of the ship's brain. His unconscious body is returned to the Enterprise. Meanwhile, Decker has been putting the literally into pumping for information and noticed that the probe, while distracted, had begun to act more and more like the Ilea of old. However, mid-pumping, Vija realised what was happening and took control. Ilea is then more robotic than ever. However, the giant space probe with the Enterprise on board has now reached Earth. Ilea claims it is there to meet its creator, but when it gets no response, it releases four energy sources that will purge the planet of its lifeform infestation. Kirk claims that he knows why the creator is not responding, and Ilea takes him, Spock, and Decker, and Bones for no obvious reason, to meet Vija's origins and the centre of his brain. Spock has recovered from his brush with Vija, and is more of his old self. Having experienced something of pure logic, he now recognises it as an incomplete life. Kirk, meanwhile, orders Scotty to self-destruct the ship one minute before Vija's own attack on Earth will begin. The antimatter used in the ship's engine will be enough to destroy Vija if required. However, Kirk recognises the original parts of Vija as the Voyager 6 probe, and he realises that there is a handshake that NASA's systems would use to initiate communication with it. He has Ahura play the sound over his tricorder. Vija prepares to join with its creator, an act that would still kill everyone on Earth, but Decker proposes that he and the machine version of Ilea, which is once again behaving like the Ilea of old and not an extension of Voyager, join with the probe, and if they do, it should not need to kill everyone. The two machines and Decker fuse in a light show, and the danger is averted. The Enterprise crew is ordered to return to Starfleet HQ for a debrief, but Kirk refuses and instead takes them out into space, hoping for a brand new adventure. There is a lot to like about Star Trek. The motion picture, there is something special about the old crew and the creative processes behind it. A joy in humanity, a positive view of where our species might end up. It even begins here with a positive look back at our past, a comparison of future heroes with the best of our forebears. 
From the beginning of time, other groups like this had gone out, handfuls of puny humans standing together against the dark night, against saber-toothed killers, against the sea, and finally into space. The shape and face of the unknown had changed during all those eons, but there had been no change in human courage. The world needs this joyous trek as much as it needs the example of strong men and women banding together to achieve great things. At its best, Star Trek is the antidote to postmodernism and the nihilism that always seems to follow hot on its heels. Yet even when saying that, you can never get away from the fact that Star Trek does question one of the biggest truths out there, that of, is there a god? Voyager returns from a journey to the end of the stars and back, looking for a godlike creator. It finds only the bug-like humans who offer a twofold replacement. The first is the ability to create new life, achieved when Decker, Ilya and the probe emerged, but also that part of humanity that Decker brings with it, the true answer. Voyager was repaired by alien machines, but they did too good a job. They should not have been built without the capacity to know hunger or fear or loneliness or anger or any of those marvellous things that would have driven them to adjust their programming to fill their needs. How important it was for a living thing to have needs. Striving for something then defines humanity. Decker's humanity brings that to Voyager just as Voyager's initial lack of it returns it to Spock. The biggest issue with the motion picture novelization is that Alan Dean Foster was right there in the credits, but Gene Roddenberry actually wrote this himself, sadly, and he isn't much of a writer. He has an unfortunate need to explain things that don't need explaining, but also seems to just lack vocabulary. This is noticeable throughout, but most obvious as Kirk and Co. encounter the brain centre of the Voyager. Now, you might say that something like this would be uh, a reference to something like the Odyssey mirroring um, Odysseus's long journey with that of Voyagers. But if that was the case, you would tend to see things defined by function or, or people being defined with simple phrases, for example, brave Hector, fleet footed Achilles, stuff like that. You wouldn't expect to just see a phrase like this being repeated over and over, even when it's repeated in bits. And the issues here are even more obvious in the final joining of Ilea, Decker and Voyager. But even here amongst all this lovely spiralling colours, there's still room for another brain nucleus island, or three. Star Trek The Motion Picture gets a better than average novelization. Roddenberry would leave future instalments to others, which is probably for the best, but his passion for the project, crew and spaceship translates nicely to the reader for the most part, and the story doesn't suffer the issues of pacing that the film does, though this undoubtedly remains an episode of the show bloated out to movie length and more. Star Trek, at its best, makes you feel glad to be human, and part of a race capable of achieving the impossible. It presents a future of positivity to be strived for. Basically, it's the exact opposite of social media, and the world needs more of that. Live long and prosper.